Okay, so uh, hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is Teresa, and um, I would like to welcome you to the 23rd uh, webinar in the Rus Copernicus series. This month, uh, we will have a look at snow cover monitoring with Sentinel-2. Um, I would like to ask you to uh, ask questions immediately as you have them, um, because uh, we are quite a lot actually today, so uh, in order not to leave everything for the Q&A session, please just, whenever you have any doubts or questions, let us know, or technical issues and so on. All right, so let's move on. Okay. So first, just uh, an outline of today's webinar. First, I will uh, very quickly introduce Rus Service. If you have attended one of these uh, webinars before, um, you will already have heard um, most of this information. However, if you are new, uh, maybe that would be something of use. Um, then uh, we will have a look at Sentinel-2, because that will be the satellite that we will be using today. And after that, I will quickly um, say a few words about snow cover and how do we monitor it from space. And afterwards, we will move on to the exercise and the Q&A session. In total, the entire webinar is going to be approximately an hour and a half, including um, the Q&A session. And all of the webinar is going to be recorded. And soon, um, it will be available on YouTube and also on our rus-training.eu website. I will show that um, a bit later. Um, and so you can always uh, rewatch the webinar, repeat all the steps at your leisure. So uh, no need to uh, write down any notes or so on during the webinar right now. All right, so let's move on. So first we will have a quick introduction to the RUS service. So um, RUS stands for Research and User Support for Sentinel Core Products, and it's an initiative that is funded by the European Commission and managed by the European Space Agency. Um, the main objective of the initiative is to promote the uptake of Copernicus Sentinel data and support R&D activities and research. Um, the service provides free and open um, scalable platform in a powerful computing, computing environment, um, hosting a suite of uh, open source toolboxes which are installed on uh, pre-installed on virtual machines that are accessible through your browser. Um, these machines will allow you to um, process uh, large amounts of Sentinel data, uh, which is uh, nowadays uh, the issue because Sentinel data are quite large and they're quite heavy to process on normal computers. So the idea behind the RUS project is to enable researchers, students, and anybody who wants to explore the data to uh, be able to do so. Uh, apart from uh, the virtual machines, we also offer our users a uh, specialized remote sensing help desk where you can ask any questions uh, relating to your application or the use of Sentinel data and also specialized training, trainings such as webinars or face-to-face -face events at different conferences or standalone. Um, you can read more about these on our web pages. So first web page here is the roofs-copernicus.eu. This web page um, contains all the information about the project, uh, its limitations, and so on. And um, you can also here register for uh, the project and request a virtual machine. <clears throat> the second web page, sorry, is uh, rus-training.eu. Probably most of you have already seen this web page, um, as this is the one where you have registered for this webinar. Here you can also find all our past webinars, including all the um, all the um, recordings of the past webinars and Q&A session summaries, um, as well as any upcoming trainings, whether webinars or face-to-face -face events. And you can also uh, check out our uh, e-learning platform where we um, post um, e-learning material um, regarding Sentinel data, SAR data, and so on. Right? The next uh, page uh, I would show you is the um, it's basically our uh, uh, YouTube uh, channel, which is uh, Rus Dash Training, uh, Rus Copernicus Training, sorry. Um, and here, as well as on the um, Rus Dash Training.eu webpage, you can find all the recorded webinars. Um, maybe here, simpler on all on one place, um, and you can uh, rewatch them and uh, repeat the exercises at your own leisure. Okay. So now let's move on to the uh, Sentinel Two intro. So Sentinel-2 is um, 
is one of the Sentinel satellites. The Sentinel satellites are a family of satellites built by the European Space Agency for the needs of the EU Copernicus program. And what is Copernicus? So Copernicus is the largest Earth observation program in the world. Um, and all its satellites and data are av available under free and open policy to everybody for either non-commercial or commercial purposes. Um, once completed, this program will be formed by six constellations uh, of two satellites each, plus one single satellite. Um, at the moment, there are seven satellites in orbit, three constellations, plus one single satellite, Sentinel-5P. Um, and they will host a range of technologies from SAR to multispectral imaging and many more. So the Sentinel-2 constellation uh, is formed by two identical satellites, Sentinel-2A and Sentinel-2B. Uh, and they both carry a multispectral sensor, acquiring data over uh, all the land areas in 13 spectral bands. Uh, the spatial resolution uh, differs by band, uh, with the visible and near-infrared bands acquired at 10, meter, at 10 meter resolution and the red edge and shortwave infrared bands acquired at 20 meter resolution, and then the atmospheric absorption bands acquired at 60 meter resolution. So you can see this on the, uh, on the schema uh, on the slide. Um, the repeat frequency is five days, and the revisit time decreases from five days at the equator to less than one day uh, at high latitudes. This is, of course, for the constellation of two satellites. So for a single satellite, the um, repeat frequency would be 10 days. The data are radiometrically and geometrically corrected and cut in 200 by 100 kilometer tiles, resampled into a common global grid, which makes it especially useful for any sort of time uh, series uh, studies and so on, because you don't need to worry about um, co-registering the data um, to a common grid anymore. So um, we have the data in two levels, level 1C, which is the top of atmosphere reflectance, and the atmospherically um, corrected level 2A. The level 2A data are available for Europe, uh, so are over operationally provided for Europe uh, since the spring of 2017, and they are globally available since um, uh, spring 2019. So, now let's uh, say a few words about snow cover and how do we monitor it from space and why do we monitor it. So uh, first, um, snow is one of the um, global climate observing systems ECVs or essential climate variables. So first I should say something about what the essential climate variables are. Uh, many of you may know that already, but the essential climate variable uh, is a physical chemical or biological variable or a group of linked variables that is criti that, that critically contributes to the characterization of Earth's climate. They are required to support the work of uh, the UNFCCC uh, and the IPCC and they have been defined uh, by the Global Climate Observing System as I've already mentioned and at the moment there is uh, approximately 54 variables or groups that have been defined. And if you look closely, of course, you can see the snow cover uh, right here. So, okay, it is an essential climate variable. However, why do we actually need to know so much and why is it so important? Um, this is because seasonal snow cover is the largest single component of the cryosphere. And in midwinter, it covers approximately 50% of the northern hemisphere's land surface. And such as such, it is an important component of the climate systems. And also, in many high-latitude regions, it is a major, if not dominant, uh, freshwater source. And uh, as such, again, it is an important contribution also to the world global, uh, sorry, uh, global water circle, cycle. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, however, when I say snow cover, um, it is very difficult to measure snow cover as such. So actually, we do not, we have to characterize it by certain variables such as, for example, the snow cover area, which we will be focusing on today, or fractional snow cover, snow, cover, snow water equivalent, snow depth, albedo, or liquid water content. So these are some of the variables that are used to measure and characterize uh, snow cover. So um, we can agree that monitoring snow cover is important. Uh, however, how do we do it? So there's, of course, ground observations. However, those can be um, not complete, uh, they are not available for large areas, only points, and so on. So mostly as of 1990s, 
we use satellite data. There is a number of operational services that provide uh, snow cover data. I only mention here a few, but for example, the THEA um, um, snow collection uh, provides data of uh, 20 meter resolution generated only for limited areas. So for example, the Alps, Pyrenees and Atlas Mountains. Um, then we have the um, Copernicus Land Management Service, which provides 500 meter resolution data uh, for continental Europe as of March 2017, and they are all based on Terra Modis data. Um, then we will, then we will in the future also have the CCI snow products, which are not yet available at the moment, and of course the NSIDC, um, which offers a variety of products with different resolution and methods and origins. So you can check one of these sources. Um, however, uh, for many cases, we don't find, we cannot find the data at a good resolution or um, for the area that we are interested in or for the time that we are interested in. So that's why we are showing you today how to process. So how do we do it? Um, basically, um, we most of the methods that are currently used use the normalized difference snow index, so NDSI, uh, which is based on the um, high reflectance of snow in the visible part of the spectra. So here the blue line shows the snow uh, reflectance and on the low reflectance in the short wave infrared part of the spectrum. So right here. And we will be using for this the bands 3, so green band, and the band 11 in the short wave infrared part of the spectrum. It's very similar to other indexes such as NDVI for example, and the values range from minus 1 to 1 um, with sort of um, rough rule you could say to no snow is uh, values below uh, zero and snow is values above zero. Um, this is, we will use a little bit different thresholds, however we will get to that a bit later. Okay, so now I will just show you quickly the uh, logic of the, uh, of the uh, method that we will be using. It is adapted and simplified from the TS snow collection, collection operational algorithm. Um, I'll give you um, a link to the article later. At the end you will have in the references and you can read um, more about the method that they use. So first, um, the input data here of course is Sentinel-2 level 2A data. Um, it is specifically the surface, surface reflectance bands in green, red, near infrared and short wave infrared part of the spectra and the cloud confidence band, which is the result of the atmospheric correction algorithm. So first we will take that cloud confidence band and also the near infrared band and we will um, basically um, divide this uh, or create our own cloud mask or cloud class which has two classes, one and two. Class two being all pixels that have confidence higher than 90% of uh, cloud presence and class, class one being class uh, where um, all pixels uh, are that have confidence 50, between 50 and 90%. Uh, for this class one, we also apply additional rule, uh, which is um, the uh, minimum reflectance in near infrared part of the spectra or band eight. Um, which we use to differentiate from um, between uh, bright clouds and clouds that are um, so-called dark clouds, um, which through which we can actually see, so uh, we uh, can still use the data. Okay, so as of that point, then we ask, we take our data again and we ask a question whether the pixel is a high confidence cloud pixel or not. So this, in this case we use cloud, class 2. Um, if uh, this is not the case, then we calculate the uh, normalized different ratio index and we apply uh, a threshold, so conservative threshold of 0.4 to the NDSI and the red band. Why do we use the red band? This is because some turbid waters have the same NDSI ratio as snow. Um, however, we can differentiate in the red band um, in this case because water will have very low uh, response in the red band. Already. Okay, so um, then from this we will get the first binary mask, which we call the snow pass one, zero, and ones. Um, from this point, we will uh, determine so-called snow line elevation. For this, we need also digital elevation model and forest type. Um, so we will basically find the area where uh, consistent snow cover starts. We will find the elevation, not the area, the elevation at which 
consistent snow cover starts. And to that area, we can apply less conservative thresholds for NDSI and the red band. So here we also use the forest type, and this is due to the fact that dense forests, such as coniferous forests, for example, um, if you, uh, when the snow is light, it stays, or new snow stays on top of the branches. However, when the snow gets older and heavier, it falls down from the branches under the trees, and it's effectively hidden from the view. However, if we consider that area, even if it's high elevation area um, where everything that's open area is uh, snow covered, and then we take the forest and we classify it as no snow, we are skewing um, our snow cover area quite significantly, and we might then run into problems in hydrological models and so on. So in this case, for the uh, snow line elevation, we also exclude all the areas that are uh, forest covered. This snow line elevation, once we uh, estimate it, we use to check whether a pixel, uh, again from the original data, is above the slow line or not. If this is the case, then we again calculate a threshold or apply a threshold on the NDSI and the red band. This time the threshold is going to be slightly less um, conservative. If this is not the case, um, then we ask, uh, so if the pixel is not above the snow line, we ask another question. We ask whether it was snow, uh, classified as snow with the conservative threshold on our pass one. If this is the case uh, for either of those conditions, we classify the pixel as snow. If this is not the case, though, for either of those conditions, we ask whether the pixel was classified as cloud in our first uh, cloud class classification or first cloud class product. If Yes, then we classify the snow, uh, sorry, we, then we classify the pixel again as cloud, or mark the pixel as cloud. If no, then we ask a question whether um, the pixel contains a dense forest, or overlays a dense forest area, or forest area in this case. If it is the case, then we mark it as dense forest, and if no, we mark it as no snow. So in the end, in our final product, we are going to have four categories which is snow, cloud, no snow, and dense forest. Okay, so this is just a quick overview of the algorithm. Um, if you didn't get everything, don't worry, you can either rewatch the video, but you will, we will also get into it uh, more uh, slowly during the exercise. Now, uh, one last thing, what data will we be using and what is our study area? So we will be using today four acquisitions which have low or no cloud cover from February and March 2019. This is from 18th, 23rd, 28th and 20th, sorry, February and 20th March. We will also use the forest type data um, as uh, developed by the European um, Environmental Agency and they are available from the Copernicus Land Management Service and we will also use digital elevation model, namely, namely the SRTM high resolution model. As for the study area, our study area is the Schumava Mountains on the boundary of uh, Czech and Germany. So there we have them. Uh, it's uh, relatively low mountains, about highest is about uh, 1200 meters, so they are not covered by most snow um, algorithms, high resolution snow um, products, so that's why we use this area. Okay, and now let's move on to the exercise. So, first I'll just show you the web page. So, um, this is the Rus Copernicus web page, and if I want to access or request my virtual machine, I go to uh, my dashboard. I'm already logged in, of course. And here I can request a new user service, request a new machine, chat with support desk, or access any virtual machines that I already have. So, here I can click on access my virtual machines. And then I will be redirected to a login site where I can log in to my machine, which is this one. I'm already logged in here just to save time. But this is basically the page that you receive when you log in to um, the Rust virtual machine. Let me just increase the size of the screen. There we go. So this basically looks like uh, any other Linux um, based uh, computer that you can find. And uh, I have all my uh, toolboxes and software uh, 
pre-installed here, so I can just go to SNAP, which is the software that we will be using today for the webinar. Um, SNAP software, if you're not familiar with it, it was developed by the European Space Agency specifically for the needs of um, uh, processing uh, Sentinel data. Okay, there we go. So this is, um, this is our SNAP software and we can load our data. So I will not show how to download the data. I have them already pre-downloaded. Uh, if you can, if you want to see how to download them, you can check out some of our uh, previous webinars, for example. Um, what I will do here also is not open them directly, but open them via a session, which means that I had uh, multiple products um, opened. Then I've saved a session and I can now re re reopen the session, sort of like a project in QGIS uh, or um, other softwares. Uh, which loads again all the data that I had preloaded. Unfortunately, it doesn't save the open views, but um, I can reopen my data. So here is my data and I will now visualize it. So I right click on the first product and I go to RGB image window. And here, so I already have a profile here, um, but there is multiple profiles you can select. Uh, it can only use uh, bands that have the same resolution. So uh, right at the moment we are a little bit limited because as I mentioned, Sentinel-2 data have different bands of different resolutions. But if you remember um, when I was showing the graph of uh, or the uh, spectral response of snow, you can remember that um, there was uh, basically um, big difference, or we will also use it, it for the NDS, uh, NDSI index, big difference in um, reflectance between um, the short wave infrared, which is these two bands, and the visible part of the spectrum. So this combination, when we use it like this, provides a natural-like rendition. Um, you will see not quite so natural, but almost, uh, while also penetrating atmospheric particles like smoke and haze. And the vegetation appears dark um, and light green during a growing season. Urban features will appear white, gray, cyan, or purple and uh, the almost complete absorption in the mid-infrared or short-wave infrared here bands in water, ice and snow causes, causes the snow appear to, to, be, to appear um, dark blue and water is very dark or blue or black. Okay, so let's open. So it'll take a couple of seconds. We'll also open the same for the other ones, just to have a look at all of our inputs. So you see I opened the same combination for each of my images. And now once they all open, so at the moment still have to wait for one. I'll go to window and tile evenly. There we go. And in the navigation window here, <coughs> sorry, I can um, zoom into all the images. So here you see this is the tile 100 by 100 kilometers. Um, <coughs> we have the mountains here and we have the snow appearing as dark blue. Um, in this image we have the slightly different color um, colors shown. Um, this is due to the fact that the clouds, which are very bright in all uh, three bands that we are using, um, skew the histogram a little bit. We can uh, fix that, however, to be comparable. Um, so here in the color manipulation tab, um, I can just play with the histogram values a little bit so they are similar as the ones of the other images. There we go. And now I have visualization that is very similar for all the four images. We can see how the snow cover um, basically shrinks, how uh, the snow melts uh, during the season. So uh, this is the image from um, mid-February and then we go all the way up to um, uh, end almost or mid-March. Uh, uh, here we have a big window between, so this image is from 28th of um, February and this one is from 20th of March, so we can see that there, 
was a much bigger change than in between these, where there is five days difference. Okay, so uh, for the purposes of this exercise, today we will only process, or I will show you the processing on this one image, uh, which has also clouds as well. Um, so we can see all the um, all the different inputs that we will need for the processing, um, and then I will show you results for all four. Okay, so uh, first thing that we need to do is um, to pre-process our data, uh, basically to calculate our NDSI and to create our cloud class um, band. I can first show you also uh, the structure of the product. So basically it is divided into subfolders and you have the subfolder that's called bands which contains all the 13, um, 13 bands. So here's 12 but we have two, eight, two bands number 8. So it's uh, B, um, B8 and B8A. Um, and uh, then we also have all the quality um, bands here which is the cloud confidence, snow confidence, um, and quality scene classification. You can then compare also your results with the quality snow confidence um, to see. And based on these quality bands, we then have uh, these masks that are derived. Those are not actual physical bands, but they are basically derived as an expression um, and virtually saved in the product. Um, they include, for example, high um, probability cloud, medium probability cloud, and so on. Okay. So um, let's now go to the processing. So if I wanted to process all four of these, um, of these products uh, one by one uh, and step by step, it would be actually quite time consuming um, and it's not, very, well, it's not very useful. So what we need to do is we can use the batch processing in SNAP. Um, and first, before we use the batch processing, we have to build our process. So we have to use the graph builder which is here. Um, so if I open the window, for each operator that I have, at the moment I only have two default ones, which is read and write, um, I will then get a tab here and I can set my parameters, I can save the graph and I can load it into batch processing and run it on as many products as I want. Also during uh, processing with the graph or with batch processing, none of the intermediate steps are saved, which means that we can also save storage space. Okay, so let's start. Uh, first operator that we will need to add is the resample operator. So you right click on the white space, you find the operator you're looking for, and you connect it to the predecessor one, uh, pre preceding one. Uh, why do we need to use the resample operator? This is because, as I mentioned, many the bands have different resolutions and many operators in SNAP cannot actually handle multi-resolution data. We also want to use then band mask, calculate with the band values to create new bands, uh, and for this, again, we need the same resolution data or same pixel size. Of course, same resolution is not the same as same pixel size, so we will resample data to the same pixel size, to be precise. Now we need to calculate the bands, so NDSI and the cloud class, and we do this by using the um, band math, so it's in raster and band math. We have one, and then for the second one we have, we will add a second band math operator. Go. And we will connect both to the resample. Now, both of these band math will only produce a single band. So we actually want to have some of the original data plus our calculated data. So we will use um, band merge and connect it to all three. So we connect it to the resample product and we connect it to the band math products, band math operators. And lastly, we want to subset our data to some smaller data set. Um, you can also process, of course, the entire tile, um, but uh, if your study area is a bit smaller, you want to um, subset the data. So we will go to raster, geometric, and subset. I can move around my operators to create a nice graph here. And once it loads, okay, I can save my graph. So say I want to save it somewhere, processing. Mm -hmm. 
there we go. So I have saved it. And now I can close my window. I can also set the parameters here, but in this case I will not do so. I will do this only um, in the batch processing. There is no difference. You can do it either way. Okay, so now I will go to the batch processing. And here um, I get the input output parameters window. And here I will use this button to load all my loaded products. So all the four products. If I click refresh, I get some more information such as the date of acquisition and so on. Here um, I will deselect the keep source product name, which if I keep selected will result in the product having the same name as the input, which uh, can be a bit tricky if you're saving your inputs uh, in the same folder where you have your outputs. Um, so I will delete this now and then I can load my graph. So I have saved the graph. Now I will just load it from here. Um, but this is the same graph uh, essentially as I built before. And there we go. So I have now all the tabs here. I don't have the graph visible anymore, but I have all the tabs corresponding to the parameters or to the operators. And I will go to uh, the resample. In the resample, uh, we have three options how to resample our data. We can either resample based on source product or by target width and height in pixels or uh, by pixel resolution. Um, so, for example, by reference band, we can resample, of course, to any of the resolutions that are already present in the product, which is 10, 20, and 60 meters. Um, so I just choose band 2 to resample to 10 meter resolution, uh, no, 10 meter pixel size. Okay? Um, if I wanted to, for example, uh, downsample to 100 meter resolution, I don't have a band available here, so I can just force to have the 100 meters um, using this by pixel resolution resampling. I can also select methods how to upsample or downsample my data because, of course, some bands here, um, some bands will stay as they are and the other bands will be upsampled. Um, so I will use the nearest uh, default method, nearest neighbor default method. Okay, so from here we will go to bump math and in bump math we will first create the cloud class. So first you set the name of your band, then we need to set a no data value, which in this case and also in all the other cases of when we are calculating will be no data, not, not a number basically. Um, this is due to the fact that it, there was a zero before, but zero is actually a valid number in most of our calculations, whether it's the cloud class, then zero is no cloud obviously, or whether it's... Um, um, for example, the MBSI, which ranges from minus 1 to 1, which makes 0, again, a valid value within the range. So we actually want to assign a different value, such as NAN. Okay, and now we pass, the, pass an expression. So um, here you can go to Edit Expression, and here you can see all the bands and all the masks that are available in the product. So we will not actually need masks anymore, but we will need uh, some uh, some bands. So what we want to say here is basically if you can type it, you can copy paste it um, as you like. Um, I will just type this first one and the rest ones I will uh, copy paste. So if the cloud uh, confidence band is higher than 90, um, then I want to assign class 2. Otherwise, again, if statement, if um, the cloud confidence band is higher than 50 and uh, the B8, band 8, so near infrared, is higher than 0 0.3 then I assign class 1, and if none of these conditions are fulfilled, I assign 0. Um, so uh, as for the parameters or uh, thresholds that I use here, uh, again, these are adapted from the method that's used for Thea um, Snow Collection. You can check them. Um, basically, the reason here is that we have a threshold that was empirically estimated um, to um, basically allow us to differentiate between bright clouds and dark clouds or haze and so on. Okay, so here we have the expression. Here um, the software checks my expression, sees that there is no errors and I can say okay and I can move on to the next parameter.
or next operator. So the next one is again band math. Here I will calculate the normalized difference snow index. Again, here again I have to change to NAN and I have to create my expression. So actually I've made my expressions prepared here in a in the text file, so I'll just copy paste it. Um, you've seen how it is calculated um, in the presentation, so I use the green band and the shortwave infrared band. Okay, and then I will go to band merge. I have all my bands that are in the original data, plus at the end I have the two newly calculated bands added. And then we don't need to do anything here, and then I will go to subset. So there's two ways I can subset my data. I can subset by bands, so I can minim make the size of the output product much smaller, because of course if I have all the bands on 10 meter resolution, um, the product is going to be huge. Um, but I don't actually need all of them, I only need some. And I also can subset by, um, or do a spatial subset by either pixel coordinates or geographic coordinates. So here we will select only some bands that we will be, keep using, which is band 3, 4, you can select multiple by hold, holding shift, um, oh, sorry, holding control, <laughs> 3, 4, 11 and 12, okay, and of course our newly calculated ones, cloud class and, uh, and DSI, and so I made the band subset and here I will make this uh, spatial subset. I will use the geographic coordinates uh, and I will use, um, so the geographic coordinates have to be given in the form of polygon in the well-known text format. You can create that also in, um, in Snap, for example, by drawing a polygon here and then you right click on it and it gives you these, uh, these coordinates or you can create it, for example, in QGIS. Okay, so I pass paste my polygon here and if I I click update, I can then see it on the map here, zoom in, and I can see in red my original product and in yellow my current subset. So it's not much smaller than the original product, but uh, it already will make our processing uh, significantly faster, for example. Okay, and finally, um, in the right tab, I can um, choose uh, the directory where I wish my products to be saved. So in my case, it would be here. And um, I can, in theory, choose a name. However, if I change the name here, the change in the name will only be applied to the first processed products and all the other ones will revert to uh, have the same name structure. So there is a subset added in the front and resampled added to the back, uh, to the end. Basically, this is dependent on the parameters you use. Some parameters add. Um, suffix or prefix and some do not. Uh, you will see that later also. But the name now is different than the name of our input and we can click run to process. Uh, if I run it like this it will take maybe five minutes. Uh, it's not a lot for the four products, however I think it would not be ideal if you guys have to wait for five minutes before this finishes, so I will not actually run anything. I will just close it and I will load a product that I have run previously. So it would be this one because I show, said I will only show you um, the processing for the for the um, for the last product. So I will load the product. Now let me just uh, change the window distribution. So I will say it's tile single and uh, close all. And then let's have a look at um, the product that we processed. Sorry. So right now I only have the four bands that I've selected and I have the cloud class and the NDSI. So let's open the NDSI by double clicking on it. And um, so the band of course is from a minus one to one and this you can see how, how uh, the NDSI looks. So you can see that actually um, the snow cover appears much broad, brighter than the, cloud, than the clouds here in the NDSI, but there's still not really an easy way to differentiate between them, so that's why we use um, um, a cloud mask in the first place. How, do our how does our cloud mask look? So let's open it. So it goes from 0, 1 and 2. So this is our cloud mask, basically. We can easily really see only uh, the number 2, but if I zoom in, you can see uh, there's some pixels 
for example here, which uh, unlikely correspond to clouds. Um, but uh, on the overall image, it still will give us a good result. So uh, now let's move on. So we have this pre-processed product, which has these four bands. And um, now we actually want to run the snow detection because the NDSI as such, we need to still apply some calculations to it to, um, to, get, um, to get the snow cover values. So the approach that we will use, I already mentioned it, but uh, basically it is done in two passes. The first pass, in the first pass, we will use a conservative threshold applied to the NDSI um, and also to the red band because some turbid waters can have similar NDSI values and we need this additional criterion to differentiate between them. And we will only apply it to cloud free pixels. Um, the thresholds that we will use in this step will be 0.4 for the NDSI, so very conservative, and uh, 0.2 for the red band. This is basically to avoid false detections uh, before we um, estimate the snow elevation line. Okay, so let's proceed with the first one. Again, we will um, now use the, the uh, graph builder and the batch processing. So I will not build the graph this time. I will just open it and show you um, how it looks and explain. So I can load a band that I uh, created previously, or a band, sorry, a uh, graph that I created previously. Okay, there we go. So in this graph, we are calculating um, the, the threshold, applying the threshold, but we are also adding data that we will need during the second pass and to, um, create, to estimate the um, snow, li snow line elevation. All right, so uh, we read the product. Here we calculate um, basically the, um, um, the uh, binary snow detection and in this step we add the forest um, mask. I will show that in a second. Uh, and in this step we will add an elevation band. Um, so there's only one issue here and that is that our batch processing can actually handle only single input graphs. Um, it still processes if I create a graph like this. However, I cannot set the parameters for this um, operator anymore in the batch processing, so I have to fix them here. Um, so I have chosen here, I have the data saved here in the in the AUX data folder. They're called, they're, it's a TIFF file, um, which is basically uh, um, downloaded from and resampled to the same resolution and same pixel size as my original data. Um, you can do that easily by using a collocation, um, but I will not get into this. Um, okay, so we have the layer here, and I can just select it and then I can save my graph. I will not do that in the moment, but I can save my graph and then I can open it in the um, in the batch processing again. I'm sorry. So here again I can load my data, but in this case I only want to load the number five. So I can actually load all of them and then just delete all the ones that I don't want. Uh, in theory, I would be now processing all of my outputs, so I would have four uh, data sets here, but um, it's okay just to show with one. Um, again, I will delete the keep source product name and I'll load the graph. There we go. So you can see that the read to tab does not appear here. It will still be used when I run the processing, but I cannot change it here. So um, here I can only go to the band mask, and in the band mask, so what do we want to do? We basically want to do the snow pass one output. Again, no data value cannot be zero because zero corresponds to no, no snow. And in the expression, um, so again, I will copy paste the expression. Here I have the input bands in my product and the expression is right here. So basically here I say that if 
uh, cloud class is not two, so not a high confidence. Um, so it's smaller than two. So the pixel is not a high confidence cloud pixel. And the NDSI is uh, higher than four. And the red band is higher than 0 0.2, sorry, 0 0.4 and 0 0.2. Um, then we assign one or snow, else we assign zero. Okay. In this step now, um, I have the band merge operator, which merges the calculated band, the original data, and the forest type. So you can see that actually the read operator works here. I have the data added, added here. And I have also my all my original data plus the calculated band. In the last step, I add an elevation band. So a SNAP has this nice feature that it can automatically download and resample an elevation um, product or digital elevation product. Uh, such as SRTM, um, there is multiple, so there is ASI30, uh, SRTM high resolution, SRTM um, lower resolution. You can also add your own external digital elevation model and so on. So in this case, we will use this one, so the high resolution SRTM. Um, you can also change the name of the elevation band, which will then appear here in the bands. We will just leave elevation. And then in write, again, we can choose our directory and we can um, check what the name is. So here is actually a, a problem which um, means that our um, output product now, because none of these parameters add a suffix or prefix to the product name, the output has the same name as our processed input. So what we can do is just save it in a different, um, uh, different um, folder. In this case it will be the pass one folder. Okay, and we run it. Again, in this case, I won't run it. I'll just show you the results. It would take, again, three, four minutes. So we can now close, and I will load the product. There we go. Okay, so you can see this product now has the bands that we had from the previous processing plus the three added. So snow pass one, forest, uh, type forest, forest type, sorry, and elevation. Um, so let's um, open the ones that we actually want to have a look at. Um, so the ones that will be as an input or we can compare how uh, the snow appears on all of these. So let me just close all that we have open here. And now I will open, again, just to remind you, the RGB. Um, here, of course, I deleted band 5 that I was using, was using before, but I can use any optical band, and it will give me very similar uh, result. Go. Again, I will tweak the colors a bit. If you're wondering where I'm getting these values, it was just from uh, the other products um, to make, the, make uh, the product look similar. So if I look at the distribution of the other products when I loaded them in the beginning, these were the values uh, approximately that were in the other ones, which gives me a, the similar um, graph stretch for the colors as, uh, as for the other ones, so I can compare. Uh, plus also it looks very pretty. <laughs> so. Um, then I can open the, um, the snow uh, pass one that I have just calculated. So this is the result. This is my snow cover at the moment, um, estimated. Then I can show you the forest type. So this is how the forest type um, layer looks. Basically, valid values are only number one and two here, and zero, of course, is no forest. Uh, here, the, um, the uh, number one is basically deciduous forest. So uh, in the winter, uh, we don't expect it to be covering the snow so much from you. Um, and number two is coniferous forest or dense forest. Okay, uh, then we can also have a look at the elevation. So this is our elevation. Um, don't get fooled, this is not uh, C. It's just a lower elevation. So we start somewhere around 320 meters above sea level here. And here it's somewhere around 1,200. Um, and we can also have a look quickly on the cloud class. And this is our cloud class. So what we can do actually is um, to open these next to one another. And somehow it 
never works lately, so it only opened four. Fifth one, I will just stretch like this. Make them a little bit even. There we go. And in navigation, I can zoom into all of them. Okay, never mind. Um, and here I can basically zoom into area and they are all zooming to the same place. So I can compare how a specific area appears uh, in different ones. So for example, I see that here it's the high altitude, highest altitudes, and I have also the highest cloud, uh, the snow cover. Um, here I can see that these areas, for example, correspond to forested areas here everywhere. And here I can see how uh, it looks on the uh, on the original image or on the band combination. And here I can see where my clouds um, are in the in the area. Okay, so this is just for visualization purposes. And we can move on to the final step of the, or actually not the final step, the one before the final step, which is the estimation of the um, cloud cover uh, elevation line or uh, snow line elevation. So how do we do this? Um, we use the digital elevation model and the snow uh, and, and the uh, forest type. Um, we use we have to divide our DEM or digital elevation model into bands. Um, and basically in each band we estimate the percentual coverage of snow in using our SnowPass product, SnowPass 1 product. So um, you can use for this in SNAP. Of course it's not really ideal to do it in SNAP. Uh, ideal would be do it, to do it programmatically or in Python or something like that, um, which then you can make more automatic. Here it's not quite so automatic, but anyway for demonstrating uh, the, the, the method, I think it's quite useful. So I have created these bands using um, the, the elevation bands using um, uh, this cloud, uh, cloud man, uh, sorry, mask manager. Um, and the mask manager has two utilities, so either you can create a mask on, any to on top of any product um, using um, an expression, so the same expression that we had here, so for example if I type cloud class equals equals two, it will put a mask on top of any pixel that fulfills this condition. Uh, or I can use, for example, um, a range mask, so if I choose an elevation, and I say I want to see the area, or I want to mask the area um, from uh, 350 to uh, 400, let's say, I will get uh, this band visualized on top of my data. So it's not masking it out, it's more just the showing the area which corresponds to this. Okay, so I've already prepared them. You can prepare them and then you can load them back on. So I will show you the ones that I have prepared can also assign different colors like this and so on. Um, so let me just stretch this a bit actually and show you the name. So here basically I have the name of the mask. You can see that there is uh, the 50 meter band, uh, so 50 meter elevation classes sort of. Um, and here is the condition. So the condition is if elevation band, so this corresponds to the band that we added here, is uh, between 300 and 350. Uh, and the forest mask is zero, so the forest data is zero, um, then we, we have this mask and we, we do this for each 50 meters basically in, in, the, in the process. So here we have them. If I want to visualize them, let me just make this a bit smaller, I want to visualize them on top of this band to have a better view on it, I will do like this. And then I can visualize them by just turning them on and you can see how they appear. So they are semi-transparent at this point. Fortunately I have to turn them on manually one by one just for the visualization. For, for any calculations I don't need to, uh, need to actually do that. Um, but here we have it. So you can see that there's still a lot of black areas or white areas that are actually not covered by any mask, mask and this is due to the fact that uh, this is a forest area, uh, so uh, it's excluded from, from this mask. And now how do we actually get the percentual snow cover from this? We can use the statistics tool, and the nice trick about it is that we have the snow, snow pass uh, 
product, which is binary, so zeros and ones. So if we, for example, draw a polygon and then we calculate an average value in that polygon of all the values, we get some value between zero and one. And that value corresponds to the percentual coverage. If we multiply it by 100, it's the percentual coverage of snow in that area. So we can do the same for all of these um, areas. Of course, they are not quite so nicely polygon, but uh, we can do the same. So we can use the statistics here, and we can basically use the Roy masks. So all of these masks, let's click on them. Then I select all of them, um, and I just refresh, and it will calculate statistics for all of my masks. It takes a couple minutes, but you can see, so this is the okay, value um, and then the percentile, um, which basically this red line or red area here shows the percentual, uh, percent of uh, pixels that is that has value 1 in this case. Um, and here we have the mean. So here actually between 30 and 350, we have no snow cover. So mean is 0. Then as we go up, we have some minor coverage. You can see that also the red line is going to get, or red area is going to get bigger. So if I zoom down as my masks go, I'm getting bigger. Here I have 10% uh, snow cover already. Go up, up, up. And here I have 30% or 0.3 then. Um, and here I have uh, 38 actually. Uh, and here already 56 and so on. And then I go all the way to uh, 100%. So um, I will choose then the band that has 38% to cover. So I, cho I set a parameter that the snow cover has to be at least 35% for the elevation to be classified or to be taken as the elevation of the snow line. So let me go back to it. So that's this one. And here in this case is a band, a elevation band that starts at 950. So I choose 950 meters above sea level as my snow elevation, um, snow line elevation height. Snow line elevation, sorry. Um, okay, so once I did that, I can also export my data to CSV, for example, here and open it and have a better look at it because then it's like a table, maybe easier to see. Um, however, I get my number so I can close it. And I can now use this to actually uh, have my final product, so to get my final product. This we will not use um, Graph Builder anymore more or batch processing, we will just calculate it manually, so it will just be one bunt math expression. Uh, it's a bit complicated bunt math expression, but it's you will see. So basically the name will be snow cover, because it's our final product. Um, I do not want to save it as virtual, so you can see that there's some differences in the bunt math operator if it's in the graph builder or if it's outside of the graph builder. Um, anyway, so we will deselect the virtual and we will go to edit expression. This one looks the same. And I will go to expressions and copy it just because it would be very long to write. There we go. So basically, what this condition says is the same as I was explaining in the flowchart in the beginning. So first, um, we will check whether um, the data is, uh, whether there is a cloud, whether the pixel is classified as high um, probability cloud. Um, then if it's not, so basically we say it's not high probability cloud, the elevation is higher than 950, and the NDSI is higher than 0.15, and the red band reflectance is higher than 0.04. If this is true, um, then uh, we also, so, so if this is true, then we set one. We also set one if the pixel was previously classified as snow in the snow pass one. So that would be for all the pixels that are below um, the, um, the snow line elevation. And so we set one, that's our snow cover. Then if the pixel was previously classified as cloud, um, so that would be cloud uh, class one basically, because cloud class two is, is always going to be um, basically not included in the first category. 
and if it was not um, if it was classified as cloud class one but not reclassified as snow at any point we will um, both of these um, we will be including them in the category nine so sorry maybe that was a bit complicated so basically if the first condition was not passed um, and the cloud class uh, that we created was uh, larger than zero so it was had some sort of cloud uh, higher 50, higher than 50 percent probability then we set set value 9 if also this is not fulfilled then we check whether the pixel um, is is classified as forest uh, dense forest or so coniferous forest um, in our forest type uh, layer so the for coniferous forest corresponds to number two uh, then if uh, it is, then we assign a number two, it's just a coincidence here, but it's number two in our final product. And if none of these are fulfilled, then we assign zero, which means no snow. Okay, so this one I will actually run. There we go. So, okay, it was very quick, but from here you cannot really see all that much. But we can change the visualization a bit. So, um, of course, here we have our categories. We have uh, zero, no snow. Then here somewhere would be um, snow and forest and then cloud. So this stretch doesn't really work. So you can create your own color palette. No, you can create it here basically by adding sliders and changing colors. Uh, so. Um, and then you can save it. So I have created it before and now I have just uh, reopened it and applied it to this product. And this is my final result. So I can see all the forest, I can see all the pixels that were classified as snow, and I can see all the pixels that were classified as cloud. And then of course gray, not all, all the non-snow, uh, forest or cloud pixels. Okay. So, so it's basically the gray is only the pixels that I'm confident that they are no snow. Okay, so this is the result of our processing. Um, you can then export it to GeoTIFF and use it in further processing or use it in to create maps and so on. Um, and um, what we can do now, I'll just show you quickly the results for the other products. So that would be these three. Okay, and quickly open them. I'll also close all my previous open bands and open this new cover here. No, there we go. So actually this one And just put them in order by time and then let's open again tile evenly oh, okay so they got um, reshuffled again unfortunately that happens but basically now we have um, the oldest or so from mid uh, February this is the result and then we go to um, to uh, 23rd of February 28th of February and uh, 20th of March. So this is our results. Uh, of course, you can choose whichever palette you like. Um, you can also calculate, for example, the mask uh, area um, using the mask manager here. So if I, for example, wanted to know what the snow covered area here is in this product, I could go here. I could use the expression here, which I would say that snow cover equals equals one. There we go. Okay, just change the opacity. Oh, sorry. Ah, there we go. Okay, so now the it's not that I changed the color, I basically covered all the snow pixels by a mask that is here now, and now I can use it to um, estimate the uh, area, so I can get area in kilometers squared by going to raster mask and mask area. So this is just the additional small step and you can find all of these steps in uh, in the PDF guide that will be available on the Rus Copernicus website and you can um, 
we do the exercise, you can request the virtual machine, you can ask for the tutorial kits to be uploaded to your machine and uh, practice this tutorial as well as uh, many other tutorials that we have um, uh, done before. Um, so you can request any tutorial kits to be uploaded there and redo the exercises and ask us for help and so on. So uh, here we have the area. So the mask area here I can see is uh, 1,663 kilometers square of snow uh, in this area. Okay, so there we go. Uh, we got to the end of our webinar. Um, I will go back now to the presentation. Go. So here, just a quick summary now. Um, so first, summary about the Roost service. Um, so the Roost service provides free uh, cloud computing environment, so virtual machines, to solve uh, problems that you might have in your research with storage, uh, computing capacity, but also with knowledge. So um, you can ask us questions on how to process um, your data, which data to select for specific applications, and so on. And then a um, few words about the snow mapping. So while many operational snow cover products are available, I've shown you all the lists with the TI and uh, all the other ones, they might not cover your uh, area of interest, so they might not be uh, suitable uh, in suitable resolution or so on. So you can use Sentinel-2 data relatively easily um, to um, generate your own snow cover product. Uh, you can, of course, tweak the algorithm uh, in any way uh, that is uh, suitable for your study area um, and so on. Um, and SNAP is also a very good tool for that. So here is just some references and links um, to have a look at the original PSNO collection algorithm that's here, uh, also at uh, some additional uh, data, for example, for the snow collection data or uh, snow uh, product data and some information about the level 2a uh, algorithm that is applied on the uh, Sentinel-2 data. Okay, and finally, um, if you want to repeat this webinar and you request a virtual machine, this webinar will be available under the code of CREO03, um, and you can see everything again on uh, our websites, as I'm mentioning them here. And if you want to hear some news uh, about new webinars, uh, new face-to-face -face events and so on, you can always follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook and also, of course, see all our videos on YouTube. Thank you for attending the webinar and for uh, hopefully you enjoyed it and it was useful to you. And we will be looking forward to uh, seeing you at some of our next webinars or face-to-face -face events. And the topic for the next webinar should be announced in the beginning of, uh, of November. So um, follow us uh, to, to uh, learn more about it. Okay, um, so bye-bye. See you next time. Ciao.